Good morning, everyone. My name is Gary Fuller, as you can see on the screen. I'm Professor Emeritus of Geography at the University of Hawaii. Uh, my PhD is in Geography from Penn State. I taught there, and I also taught at Ohio State. Uh, my purpose in, in being here this morning is to help you enjoy your cruise. Uh, and uh, I do that by uh, talking about the destinations we're going to. Uh, now, I'm not, a, I'm not a guidebook. You can buy a tour book and learn all about what hotels to go to and restaurants and so on. Uh, I, I go considerably beyond that. You won't find what I have to say in many guidebooks. Uh, and I'm not, a, uh, I'm not a, 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 a tour guide on the ground either. I, I don't know where you should go to shop. I can tell you how to do that, as I've told many people. Just put your credit card in your hand, sort of walk down the street with it, and I guarantee the world will come to you in terms of shopping. Well, uh, in our uh, lecture a, a couple days ago, uh, we talked about going through the Panama Canal. Uh, we talked about the, the plague, uh, the American plague, as they called it, that kept the French from building the canal. And we talked about the, the kind of directional feature of the fact that we, we actually go west in the Panama Canal slightly to enter the Atlantic Ocean. You go, it seems, seems strange, but you go east to, to enter the Pacific and west uh, to enter the Atlantic. Of course, there's not north and south components to that as well. But today we're in the Atlantic Ocean, or more specifically in the Caribbean Sea, and we're headed towards our next port, which is Cartagena, Colombia. Now, as you can see from the map uh, that's in front of you, uh, Cartagena, Colombia is a rather large port, or at least it was in the, in the past. Uh, y this uh, particular map was drawn around 1540. It was before uh, fortifications had been built at Cartagena. Uh, and uh, you can see the ships in the harbor. Uh, Cartagena was the main point, along with Veracruz in Mexico, that shipped gold from the Americas back to Spain. Uh, it was an extremely important port. Uh, over time, the, uh, the city developed huge fortifications to protect the gold that it held there, as, as did Veracruz, by the way. Uh, a third port was late, uh, added later on, and we'll talk about that later in the lecture. But Cartagena remained the principal port. Uh, let's, uh, let's now turn our attention to why uh, the Caribbean was such an important area for piracy. And I guess I've already explained that. There was a lot of gold that was being transshipped uh, across the Caribbean and on to Spain. And in the Caribbean, because of the patterns of winds, uh, the Caribbean made an ideal place uh, for pirates to operate to try to interfere with the gold trade. When the Spanish first came to the Americas, they did uh, a, a rather strange thing. They realized it was going to be difficult to explore foreign coasts. A and so they, I in fact, went to small islands in the Caribbean that they discovered, and they put herd animals ashore in them. They put goats and sheep and, and especially cattle. Uh, these were especially on dry islands. Uh, they did it on some of the larger inhabited islands as well, but the, the idea was uh, the Spanish ships were going to get shipwrecked. Uh, Columbus had already run into this incredible storm. They hadn't used the uh, uh, Carib Indian word hurricane to describe it yet on his fourth voyage, uh, and he was deeply troubled by how, how severe the wind was. I might add, incidentally, that that hurricane struck Columbus in May. Uh, with today, we would consider that uh, too early for hurricanes, but it was a rather savage storm. So the Spanish knew that, gee, we don't have any charts for the Caribbean. Our ships are going to be wrecked uh, on uh, reefs that we don't know about, and they're going to run into storms. So it's a good idea if we make provision for this by putting animals ashore on these islands. Actually, it, it sounds like a, a pretty cockamamie idea, uh, putting animals ashore. It, it actually worked. Uh, the animals thrived on the dry islands, 
Um, they multiplied, and they did, in fact, provide a major food support uh, source, both for shipwrecked sailors and for normal crews uh, of the Spanish that came through the area. One other little footnote I might add to this. Uh, the Spanish discovered another thing uh, that they found made a wonderful food supply that they could carry with them, and that was, uh, that was turtle. Uh, and they captured sea turtles by the thousands in the Caribbean and then later in the Pacific. They just bring the turtles uh, on board, uh, keep them uh, until it was time to eat them. Uh, and that, that became an ideal food source as well. In any case, uh, some uh, sailors were shipwrecked, some deserted from the, uh, the Spanish fleet, uh, and they were able to survive on these islands that had these herd animals. Maybe another little footnote here, in, in case you're, you're kind of dubious about how successful these animals were. For those of you in the audience that may be from Texas, you're certainly acquainted with the Texas Longhorn. Well, the Texas Longhorn is actually a descendant of Spanish cattle that the Spanish put ashore uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and by the 1860s, they numbered in the, uh, certainly in the, in the thousands and probably in the millions of head of cattle. Now, the, um, the shipwrecked sailors were depended heavily on meat in their diet, and they developed a sort of early should we call it a barbecue pit, charcoal grill, um, on which they grilled their meat. Uh, this grill became known, especially in Haiti, as a boucan, B-O-U-C-A-N, French word. Uh, and uh, that's where the word buccaneer came from. So these people were known as buccaneers while well, they were still shipwrecked on the islands. But in time, uh, uh, they began to lure ships ashore Sometimes in trade, after all, some of these Spanish ships uh, that were going through the area and ships of other countries as well uh, were in need of food. And food was available on these islands from the animals the Spanish had left. So it was no surprise that uh, they, they would tend to, uh, come ashore. Now, in some cases, legitimate trade did occur, but in many cases, um, the shipwrecked and deserted and deserters on shore uh, captured the ships and that really became the origin of Pirates in the Caribbean. Uh, Pirates in the Caribbean that I, I guess has made Walt Disney millions of dollars from uh, his exhibits at uh, Disneyland and Disney World and for the Johnny Depp movies that have been made. But Pirates in the Caribbean was certainly a, a very real thing. Uh, between 1670 and 1730 uh, it became a major source of employment. There were at least 2,000 people employed in, in piracy. And remember, this is on relatively small ships. There were some women as well. Uh, and for those of you in the audience that may be, how do I put this politely, uh, over the hill, maybe your Social Security is running a little short at the moment, uh, pension isn't paying off as well, w what is open to you? Well, today, I guess you could go and become a greeter at Walmart, you know, get the shopping carts all done for people coming in. But in, in uh, 1670, you could have become a pirate. There were a lot of senior citizens that were engaged in piracy. Uh, and, and one of the reasons for this, uh, this sort of uh, occupational trait that met women and and uh, older people had equal opportunity employments was that it was a fairly easy job. Uh, now, admittedly, you had to know something about sailing a ship, but compared to the, uh, the crews that were normally used by the Spanish or British or some other uh, country that was sailing at the time, the discipline on pirate ships was rather relaxed, uh, and the pay was really good. Now, there's a downside to this, which we'll get to in a moment. But to give you an idea of how successful you could be as a pirate, uh, you may have seen the movie The Princess Bride, and in that you know the, the terrible pirate Roberts, who uh, uh, sort of an immortal role in the movie, one man replacing that role after another. So the 
the terrible pirate Roberts goes on forever and ever. Actually, there was a terrible pirate Roberts in the Caribbean. His name was Bart Roberts, and he was better known as Black Bart. And uh, during his career, he captured or, or sunk over 400 ships. Now, no question, the, the principal thing that the pirates were after was Spanish gold and silver. And, and I might say a, a little bit about differentiating this as well. The Spanish did discover gold in the Aztec realm of Mexico and the Incan realm on the west coast of South America and in other locations. But what they found also was silver mines, silver in, in great quantities in both Peru and in Mexico. Uh, some of you perhaps have been to Tosco, Mexico, seen the silver mines there. The Borda family uh, became enormously wealthy, perhaps one of the wealthiest families in the world at the time, uh, through the uh, mining of silver. But in Europe itself, there was a kind of geographic pattern of coinage. In Western Europe, including Spain, gold was the medium of exchange. But further east, the further east you went, uh, the more common silver was as the medium of exchange. So when the Spanish were mining both silver and gold, these different coinages are flowing to different parts of Europe, have different value in different places. Um, and as I pointed out already, the two major ports from which these uh, metals were shipped were Cartagena, Cartagena was probably the major port for silver, but it shipped gold as well, and Veracruz, Mexico, which was probably the major port, at least in the early years, for shipping Aztec gold. Now, in the map that you can see in the corner of the screen right now, you can see that there were passages through which the, uh, the Spanish ships had to sh sail. And this is important because the Spanish had limited routes that they could take to get their, their gold and silver back to Spain. The pirates, who were good geographers, realized that they could locate their bases in ways to disrupt this trade. Let's look at this in a little more detail now. Here it shows the three, this map shows the three major passages and, and the sources for the metals that are going. You can see, for example, if you look at South America first, you can see along the west coast of South America that uh, silver is being shipped from New Castile. Uh, that, that was the name of the uh, area at that time. Uh, through the Isthmus of Panama, it was carried by uh, pack, pack mule and horse through the Isthmus of Panama and then shipped from there to Cartagena early on, later, uh, Panama City itself became the third major uh, port in the Caribbean for shipping gold and silver. Now, when the Spanish left the Caribbean by ship, they had three major routes that they could take. Um, they had to get north, and the reason they had to get north was because they had to pick up the westerly winds. Now, if you're in a, a cruise ship today, you, don't, you, you have some concern with the wind, of course, uh, winds can uh, uh, make the sea a little rough. They can actually s slow down the ship. There's a lot of wind resistance to uh, cruise ships, uh, very large cruise ships of the day. But pretty much you can go anywhere you want in a, uh, in a cruise ship. But in sailing ships, you were dependent upon the direction of the winds. Now, in the Caribbean itself, the winds were from the northeast. They were trade winds. So essentially, they were blowing the ships towards the continent of the Americas. When the ships left the ports, whether it was Cartagena, Veracruz, or later on Panama City, they had to go into the wind, into the northwest, north uh, easterly trade winds. That means they had to tack. They were rather slow, another way of putting it, until they got far enough north to pick up the prevailing westerly that would carry them to Spain. There were three major passages through which they went. And maybe we'd find a better map here and show this uh, 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 in a little more detail. Um, this is an early uh, chart uh, of the Caribbean, and you can see that the, the shapes of the land uh, are not very accurate. Um, we had not yet invented a means of measuring longitude at this point. So although we could measure a distance north and south, 
fairly effectively, that is latitude, we couldn't do it east and west. And this uh, superimposition here of this map shows the prevailing winds. And you can see in, in the, uh, near, as you near the equator, um, the winds come from the northeast. And then as you move up further north, the winds are blowing pr uh, prevailing winds from the west. And since you want to get to Spain, which is to the, the, uh, to the east, you want the westerly wind behind you. Now, this is one of the major routes right here. This map uh, may not look like Florida. Florida's changed a bit, I, I admit. But this is the way the Spanish portrayed it. And the passage that they went through, uh, probably the most single most important passage, is shown by this uh, animated slide. It's through the Straits of Florida, between Cuba and, and Florida. So uh, the, the next map you'll see shows the other, uh, another major uh, passage. This is the Windward Passage, and it goes between Hispaniola and Cuba. Now, Hispaniola is an island, modern island, that contains the countries of the Dominican Republic and Haiti. Uh, the, uh, the Windward Passage goes right past Haiti today. And then the third passage, and this is one that the ships from Cartagena would like to have used, is the Mona Passage. It's between Hispaniola and Puerto Rico, or today between the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. And you can see it as an animated slide on, on, on here as well. Uh, the, uh, the Mona Passage was not a preferred passage. There are a lot of small islands and reefs that are in the passage. Uh, and if you had to, uh, had to go through that at night, or if you had a shift in wind, and of course we're talking about northeasterly winds and westerly winds and so on, but the winds would shift. The winds uh, have a, a tendency to be, uh, oh, I don't know, quite, they're vague at times. It's hard to tell which direction they're coming from. Uh, but these are, when I'm talking about northeast or westerly winds, we're talking about the prevailing or dominant winds. So the Mona Passage was not preferred, but it was a third passage through which they went. So now you've got the three passages that the treasure ships have to go through. The pirates, being good geographers, are going to locate their bases where they can intercept these routes. Um, the most important bases were, first of all, at Nassau in the Bahamas. That's up here in the north of the map, as you can see a circle on the, on the uh, map. Uh, and that was positioned to intercept all that trade that was going through the Straits of Florida. And we've uh, superimposed on the map also that original route that the Spanish would take. Uh, then uh, there was an uh, 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 important island off the coast of Haiti called Tortuga. Uh, and Tortuga was positioned to intercept the trade that went through the Windward Passage. Um, Port Royal, Jamaica, uh, is south, and, and, and it can intercept both passage through the Windward Passage or uh, through those few ships that took the Mona Passage. So you, you've got basically a geographic strategy of location. The Spanish are restricted where they can go through the Caribbean, and now the pirates are locating their bases uh, to intercept these ships. Now the Spanish, of course, were... Were, were quite wise about what they did. Uh, they realized they were pirates there. Um, and one of the first things they did was fortify their bases. They wanted to make sure that both Veracruz and Cartagena were well guarded. Later, when Panama City became uh, a base as well, it became very heavily fortified. Uh, these were considered absolutely unassailable strong points. Uh, when we see uh, Cartagena tomorrow, you see what I mean. It's, it's hard to believe anyone could have taken Cartagena by force, uh, at least in the days when uh, we had naval power and uh, uh, cannons were used and so on. They would have been totally ineffective against the fortifications of Cartagena. Um, this, these are some, uh, some pictures that show what the, the fortifications look like today. Of course, in, in the days of piracy, they were in much better shape than they are now. Now, the, the Spanish would, in fact, use 
convoys to ship their gold and silver, um, a strategy that was similar to that which was developed by uh, the United States during World War II to ship goods to Britain um, through the, the submarine um, wolf packs that Germany had in the Atlantic. Uh, convoy strategy, incidentally, took a long time to develop. Um, the United States finally decided that smaller convoys were better than large. Uh, smaller convoys that took variable routes. But remember, the convoys in World War II were with motor-driven ships. They could go in a variety of directions, whereas the Spanish ships were required to go, in, generally speaking, uh, in a rather narrow track through those narrow passages and then picking up the, uh, the uh, prevailing westerlies. So along these routes, uh, the Spanish uh, would often uh, run into trouble. The Spanish had a reputation, and I'm, I'm sorry to label a whole nation this way, they had a reputation of as not being particularly good sailors. Uh, the British used to laugh at them, as a matter of fact. They won some important naval battles without ever firing a shot by maneuvering the Spanish to send their fleet aground. Uh, and if we go way back to the days of the Spanish Armada and Elizabeth I, um, you can see the same thing. The Spanish ships were just not equipped uh, to be able to wage the kind of war that the British could in their smaller, faster ships. But what would happen in sailing ships, it happens in all sailing ships, um, you're, you're, you're putting up some sails and your, your running gear becomes fouled or broken. Uh, you may break a spar, a mast. The ship begins to lag. The rest of the convoy cannot heave to and wait for you. That ship is going to lag behind. And those are the ships that the Spanish, uh, uh, sorry, that the pirates uh, particularly went after. Um, just as uh, sharks will, will follow, a, a, for example, a uh, a, a, a pot of whales looking for the weak ones, uh, so the pirates would look for the weaker ships. They did, however, uh, fight head-on battles with Flota, uh, so uh, it, it could work both ways, look for stragglers or take them on generally. The pirate ships were, were generally had better sailors. Uh, they often had British, uh, de uh, British deserters on board, um, they often had better officers than the Spanish ships did in terms of being able to maneuver and navigate their ships better. They had some advantage. After 1830, uh, sorry, after 1730, the British Navy put an end to piracy in the Caribbean. I don't mean to say it ended absolutely right at that point, but it no longer was a major factor after 1730. Uh, and one of the ways the British did this was to enlist the pirates on their own side. Uh, they would issue uh, letters of mark uh, to the uh, pirates, the particularly the successful ones, and turn them into privateers. Now the pirates had already learned that their life was a rather promising career. And, but unfortunately, they faced a, a, if they were caught by the British Navy, uh, they often ended up, as this slide shows, with a noose around their neck. Now, if the, the British, in fact, could uh, legalize them, legitimize them as pirates, uh, issue them the letter of mark, they had the best of both worlds. They were still entitled to keep the booty that they got. Even the British Navy was, by the way. If the British Navy captured a Spanish vessel loaded with gold, uh, originally all the goodies on that ship, including the gold, belonged to the crew. Uh, later on, the British government passed a rule that uh, made the gold belong to the government. But early on, all those goodies belonged to the crew itself. So now you could be a pirate, and you could be licensed to be a pirate by the British. And that was really a good thing. Some of these uh, so-called licensed pirates became very famous. Henry Morgan was probably the most famous one. Uh, Morgan did something that uh, was considered impossible. He actually attacked uh, the gold depository at Panama City and took it. Remember, I said these forts were considered impregnable at Cartagena, at Panama, and at Veracruz. 
but Morgan succeeded in an overland attack uh, of taking, uh, he landed his crew uh, on, on the coast of Panama and then they took the fort with an overland attack. So he got the gold directly, he didn't even have to stop a ship. But Morgan also was one of the more successful pirates, privateers in the Caribbean. Uh, he uh, moved to Jamaica, became a sugar planter, uh, became uh, the wealthiest man in Jamaica, and uh, later became the lieutenant governor of, of Jamaica itself. Went into politics, so to speak. Notice, I, I don't think we still have pirates going into politics today, do we? I, I, don't, I don't think so, no. Forget I said that. Jean Lafitte, uh, almost as famous as Morgan, uh, a Frenchman in this case who was a privateer, sailing for the United States. He was a notorious pirate in the Gulf of Mexico uh, and uh, joined the U.S. forces as a privateer, was instrumental in uh, disrupting the British fleet uh, at the Battle of New Orleans in 1814. This was incidentally a, a battle that occurred after the war was over, but it was probably the, mo the most famous victory of the United States in the War of 1812 occurred some months after the war was over. So that completes uh, all I have to say about the Pirates in the Caribbean today. Um, I have a couple minutes left, and I'd be glad to a answer any questions that might come from the audience. Do we have any questions at all? Not a single question. I, I've, I've covered all this. Not, not, not even one question? Well, okay. All I right. Have a all right, please, were there sir. Ever any um, women pirates? Oh yes, there were. In fact, uh, they, they weren't numerous, but there were women pirates. As I as I said, uh, if you've been paying really close attention to the lecture, I mentioned that in the lecture, and I also mentioned that there were elderly people that were involved. So there was uh, equal opportunity uh, employers, and in fact, the crews of the pirate ships were of mixed nationality. They had, uh, and this was was not true with merchant ships. It was true with pirate ships. Now you'll notice on the screen uh, a world famous book uh, written that I have written, especially for cruise passengers. It was nominated by the American Library Association as Book of the Year, uh, and uh, I suggest you go online to my website at geotrivia.org. You can order it there if you're a cruise ship passenger you get a discount. Thank you very much for your attention. I, I really appreciate seeing you here today. I hope to see you in a couple days when we continue our sea days in the Caribbean.